Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Borderwise, and welcome back to From the Depths. And welcome back to another Advanced Canon Tetris tutorial. Uh, for what I will be calling, for the sake of convenience, Long Loaders, which is any uh, loader for Advanced Cannons that's longer than one meter, since we've already covered that in a previous video. So, uh, usual disclaimer, I am not an expert when it comes to the APS. Uh, what I'm going to show you in this video is the stuff that uh, works for me and is essentially about as straightforward as I can make it in terms of making reliable advanced cannons. So, that's basically it really. So, before anything else, I'm just going to introduce you to the shell uh, that we're using on this particular fortress. It's nothing fancy, 250mm HE warhead uh, with a 2 meter loader length. So. That's what we're starting with, 2 meter loaders, because that's the next size up. So, the thing about uh, uh, loaders that are longer than 1 meter is that the Tetris for them, I kind of uh, split it in between horizontal and vertical configuration. So, if it's basically, it's geometry. So, if you have a 1 uh, by 1 by 1 meter um, uh, block, you can, like, vertical and... Uh, horizontal is basically exactly the same. There's no functional difference, which means that uh, with one meter loaders you can uh, kind of orient them and their loaders in all kinds of crazy directions and still uh, manage to tuck it in reasonably neatly into a 3x3, 5x5, 7x7, etc, etc space. Uh, the split second you have something that is more than one meter long. Now there is a functional difference between uh, orientating them uh, vertically or horizontally. So, say I have a, uh, let's just go here, a 3 uh, by 3 space, and I want to organize my blocks in a certain way. With 1 meter loaders, I can have 9 of them, easily. And if I have 2 meter loaders, there's 1, 2, 3, and 4, whoopsie daisy, that's all I can fit. Uh, or I can stick nine of them again, but it's just that's taking twice as much volume. So it depends on what uh, constraints you have uh, to work with. So big distinction there. Like the longer loaders are where these things get a little bit more complicated. And hopefully what I show you is helpful in being slightly less complicated. So uh, remembering back in the Misty Mist of Times talking about uh, loader stacking, which is basically the bulk of the turret, the main column, so to speak is made up of the loaders. So here we have a line of loaders and clips coming off to the side because whenever possible replace uh, loaders with clips uh, unless you have good reasons not to. And the inputs are... A side note here, the ammo intakes are on the front because the ammo intakes, funnily enough, uh, they don't explode. So this uh, buys the turret about a nanosecond if the hole uh, in front of it is breached and the turret compartment is breached and this buys an extra, oh, I don't know, maybe an extra, well, nanosecond, like I said, before the actual turret gets taken out and the whole thing falls off, or blows up. So, yeah, that's the main reason I stick inputs, uh, or intakes, rather, in the direction uh, the turret is pointing, which is the front, usually. So, what is the deal with this thing? Is that, well, it's just a loader stack, and uh, two meter loaders are where this loader stack and stops being straightforward, because uh, turrets, in From the Depths, um, the, they go up in odd numbers, so to speak, and the shape they take uh, needs to be adjusted as you go. So you can have a 1x1 one one turret, which hardly ever gets seen uh, because it's not very useful. And then you get 3x3 three three turrets, which can turn uh, in a space. Then you get 5x5, 7x7, so on and so forth. And the thing with 2 meter loaders is that once you stick an input on the end of them, like... So, oh look, that is uh, that is three meters long exactly, and once you have this, then you have three by three, and you can stack them right there. If you have just one thing longer than that, now you have a four um, meter long uh, configuration, which just, this does not work well as a turret. You, it doesn't actually turn, because From the Depths um, hates things uh, that are even width in general, this is even width, and admittedly you can go up to uh, 4 meters, uh, but you'll notice this is starting to get increasingly big, and you need to do fancy stuff in order to keep this uh, all in there. It also means that if you want to be symmetrical, 
um, with your um, replacing loaders with clips, uh, you will now have noticed that uh, this is no longer completely even. And so it's not a bad thing. We're still um, got a functionally five auto loaders in here, uh, but this is starting to make things a little bit weird uh, and complicated. So two meter loaders is where this kind of uh, uh, loader stacking um, that's about as simple as it gets for long uh, loaders, and it's all downhill from there. So, generally speaking, what you're probably going to see and probably use a lot is vertical stacking. So that's just orientating uh, the loaders um, vertically so that you can make a nice circular shape uh, using the fact that they are uh, one meter by one meter in two of their dimensions. I probably could have described that better, but never mind. Anyway, this is a lot simpler, and uh, it does have the downside is that your uh, turret, at minimum, if you're going to be using, say, 2 meter loaders, it's going to be an absolute minimum of 3 meters tall. Like, if you have them stacked vertically. Like, there's no way around that, that's how big the block is. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the it requires a little bit different Tetris than uh, loader stacking over here, and... The uh, central thing is that now the main pillar isn't actually made up of loaders, it's made up of uh, gauge increases or gauge coolers, which is just generally referred to as the gauge snake, because it snakes up here and kind of snakes around all willy-nilly. So that's basically what this is, and um, you'll notice that I've named this the unfortunate symbolism, and that is because uh, of how the uh, kind of um, the loaders wrap around the snake. It is a swastika shape. I do remember somebody telling me a way to avoid that, but it's not really a biggie. We know, like, if you use this, that doesn't automatically make you, you know what. We all know and understand this. Uh, just don't get too cavalier. Like, you know, I'm not sure what I mean by that, but you get the idea. So that's why I call this the unfortunate symbolism, uh, because that is unfortunately how the geometry of this works. Moving right along, you can, uh, Basically, uh, a thing I've learned with turrets is that the efficacy, which is, I guess, both efficiency and effectiveness at the same time, um, you're better off going wider before you go taller. Um, for a number of reasons, one of which is that if you're mounting this on a ship, that keeps the center of mass nice and low, and doesn't mean the thing's too tall, because tall ships tend to be more prone to rolling over. And uh, also, if... Um, your craft is getting shot at from the side, which tends to, well, be most of the time, really. Um, or from the front, or from... Yeah, sides or front is the usual trick. Um, usual trick, that's a weird way to phrase it. But in any case, um, the lower your profile, the more likely things are to whiff over or under you. So, that is why generally, uh, if you're with your turrets, it's better to err on the side of going wide rather than going too tall. There, of course, is a middle way between it, and I would recommend um, your turret being roughly, or at very least the under part of the turret, so the bit with all the loaders in it, should be roughly as tall as it's wide. So right here we've got uh, this kind of, uh, uh, the turret itself and the little armor packing around it that I always do because it's handy for stopping your turret falling off randomly. Uh, that is about one, two, three, four, and the turret is about one, two, three, four, five meters wide. So that's nice and compact and a, roughly a square shape. Uh, this top bit doesn't really count because uh, that will probably be part of the turret cap, which will be above deck anyway. So let's read up on my notes here. And, well, basically I said everything. I have left a lot of notes for myself, which I'll be rediscovering as we go. So, width is the thing. Now moving on here... Uh, we're talking about necks. So this is functionally the same turret, except for two things. Uh, you're going to hear me talk about something called undergrowth and overgrowth, and that is the term that I don't believe is used that much in the From the Depths community uh, as a whole, but it's what I used to describe just having a layer of loaders, well, no, not loaders, sorry, a layer of gauge increases and coolers uh, underneath or above uh, where the loaders are hanging out. So you'll see uh, this is what I mean by undergrowth or I guess underlayer, uh, the bottom layer of whatever it is you're doing down here, which don't have to be coolers by the way. You can sneak in all kinds of stuff like recoil absorbers, railgun chargers, more on them later. And the main reason for doing this is that uh, this is just kind of making a base uh, 
for your stuff to sit on. And it also means that um, if I do this, for instance, uh, this is not connected, but now it is. So basically you're creating a foundation to stick uh, loaders on and they can be nice and connected, which makes APS Tetris, uh, particularly once things get a little bit bigger, a lot easier because it means they don't have to be uh, just spiraling off uh, the same central column, which you will run out of room eventually. Um, giving you an example, like if I want to extend this out a little bit more with this tarp that has no undergrowth, um, I'm going to immediately run into a problem uh, because you'll notice that in the corners here, oh, damn it, I need to... I can't actually stick any extra loaders because they can't connect to anything. Because loaders do not collect uh, to clips. And having an undergrowth or an overgrowth, as functionally very similar, uh, avoids that problem. So if I go here, I go here, I go here, and then I go here, I go here. Oh no, whatever am I going to do? I can just extend uh, the undergrowth and there we go. And we can carry on my wayward son. Beautiful. Molto bene! The, uh, the APS turret is coming together. Why did I turn Italian? So, uh, I tend to use undergrowth and uh, a lot when I design APS turrets and simply because, if nothing else, it allows you to get the cooling out of the way. You'll notice that this has um, uh, it's 26.2 rounds per minute, which isn't super good, but this turret is kind of on the small side. And it's doing, well, it's the uh, it's less than this one, I believe, but you will notice that this one, uh, because it's kind of short, it kind of has to stuff all its coolers into the turret right here. And so, this is one of the advantages of having a neck, uh, by the way, is I don't always use them, they're not essential, uh, but it is handy to keep your turret cap small, and this is what the neck is good for, because it means that you can essentially do this. So you go here, and this is a... Uh, one by one turret neck, which is not a very good idea, so I don't recommend you do that. But it means that you can essentially have only a small part of the entire system above deck, which is very handy, very straightforward. You can, um, like what you have here, have a neckless design, uh, but there's pros and cons for that. The main advantage for that is that uh, the whole system is shorter, it doesn't need to be as tall, but it does mean that there's a more direct line uh, from the top uh, straight down into your turret. So, in practice, uh, even my necklace turrets tend to have an extra layer of armor in between uh, what is usually the uh, top layer of intakes or loaders and uh, what's sitting on top of them. So, handy to keep in mind. And now we go over here. So, this is where, once things get a little bit bigger, is... Uh, you can stack them on top of each other. So this is a fun, interesting thing, and it was where uh, having both undergrowth and overgrowth of coolers comes in handy. So, uh, going for roughly the same height as width seems to give best overall results. One big APS is generally better than multiple smaller ones, mostly because of the cost saving from not needing multiple firing pieces, barrels, coolers, etc. More on that in a second. So. You'll notice what I've done here is it's very similar to what I've done here. We've got a layer of coolers down here. Here is a five-way connection down there. These things are fantastic. There's no reason not to use them, if nothing else, because they cost exactly the same as the corners, the four-ways, and the splitter. And so I just have just a layer of these things right there, so because, well, why not? It makes it idiot-proof. And then just a layer of coolers with some gauge increases there, get all the cooling out of the way. Uh, you can end up with excessive cooling if you do this, particularly if you're going for, like, a smaller gauge APS, especially if it has multiple barrels, but especially for bigger ones that use a fair amount of gunpowder, this kind of layer of uh, cooling is a pretty good idea, and I do it all the time. So, uh, we've got that layer of autoloaders in there with just its autoloaders uh, spreading outward uh, from the central column right here. And you'll notice here in the corners what I was talking about earlier, uh, I can stick extra loaders and sparange clips off them simply because we've got a nice extra layer down here, which is like, mwah, it is so handy, so useful. But then, uh, up on top here, uh, room for another layer of loaders, we've got uh, another layer, so overgrowth. And where this is handy is that if I uh, wasn't going to have that, uh, I would be in trouble if I just tried to stick the same 
uh, configuration of loaders just there, because the corners would be, well, orphaned, I guess, they wouldn't be connected. Which is why this is actually exactly the same configuration, uh, but the corners are upside down, so they're still connected. So, you'll see here, this autoloader is attached to the top, and it's got clips coming off the bottom, uh, unlike down here, where it's connected uh, down there. And these guys uh, don't need to be uh, flipped upside down, because there's just a line of autoloaders connected to the central part here. So, what happened was... I built this, I prefabbed it, I stuck it up here, once making sure there was enough room for it, and then I just flipped the corners uh, upside down, so everything's nice and connected and super cool. And the great thing about having uh, layers like this is that you can just jam uh, whatever you need in here, there, and everywhere if you don't need that much cooling. And in this particular case, I've snuck a recoil absorber in here, which is fantastic. And you'll notice that the recoil is sufficient, so as per usual, uh, you want to balance uh, the firing rate is limited by autoloaders, ammo intakes, uh, cooling, and recoil. Because if you have too much recoil, your gun is very inaccurate. Incidentally, up here, you'll notice I've done uh, another form of unfortunate symbolism uh, with recoil absorbers. So this is something uh, that I do fairly often, and I even have a prefab for it. It's just, uh, if you want to get as much recoil absorption into a... A 3x3 slice, so to speak. Um, I actually find this kind of useful, simply because if you want to wrap around a 1 meter, um, a one meter space, uh, 2 meter long things are quite handy for that, and I do that fairly often in building. So, recoil absorber here, 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 here. Unfortunate symbolism, much apologies, but it allows me to uh, essentially get as much recoil absorption into that space as I could possibly think of. There's probably a better way of doing this, but I'm not sure what it is. So, and coincidentally, uh, if you don't need any more cooling, what you can do is use connectors instead. So connectors come in handy uh, once you don't need any more coolers or gauge increases and you don't have to worry about joining different APS systems together, and you can do uh, stuff like this, and you just carry on uh, my wayward son, and just get as much recoil as possible. Super handy dandy. And um, I'm going to blow up a marauder uh, just because uh, we're here. So you'll notice that all these things uh, have different rates of fire, and uh, here is where uh, my little memo down here, uh, talking about how one big ABS tends to do better than a bunch of smaller ones, uh, APS comes with like a standard set of cooling um, just as part of the firing piece. It's built in, recoil absorption and all that. And um, so yeah, like you can take advantage of that from multiple firing pieces, but um, multiple firing pieces, multiple ma mantlets and stuff is expensive and you are usually better off just having one APS firing piece and then just min-maxing the hell out of it rather than just having a bunch of them. Which sucks for all the people who like uh, multi-barrel turrets, uh, a la World War II uh, warship style, but that's kind of how it is. Excuse me while I check my uh, notes to see if I missed anything. I didn't yet, so let's move right along. Let's talk about... 8-meter uh, loaders. So, I have skipped ahead uh, to this, because 8 meter loaders are where people's eye is naturally drawn, because that is as big as APS loaders get. And here are, is um, where we really see uh, the, the functional difference between height, between stacking your loaders vertically uh, versus horizontally. So, the thing with an 8 meter long loader, especially if you do what I've done here and stuck some undergrowth underneath it, is that it's really damn tall. And automatically, you're going to have a ship that's really damn tall, is the thing, you know. So, let me introduce you to what these things are firing. These are 400mm guns, uh, because uh, the maximum uh, ammo controller length, or ammo customizer, is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 4 block uh, components, so with 4 modules on it, and that's about as long as shells can get. They cannot get any longer than this. That was uh, a pretty essential patch added some time ago, because otherwise APS shells can get, you know, even more ridiculous than they already are. So this is um, one of my favorite shells. It's HP Sabo, 
And funnily enough, you don't really need railgun draw in order to make this thing as it is useful because it's got as much gunpowder as you can possibly jam into it. It's got 42 armor piercing, and in this configuration it does like 13,000 thump damage, so it's nothing to sneeze at. And speaking of railguns, this is where things get interesting. So first I'm going to talk about the loader configuration. Is This is something I've worked out with uh, 8 meter loaders. Is you'll notice there's a fair amount of connectors in here, and quite possibly I'm being a little lazy uh, in just replacing all of this with connectors. Uh, not the best idea. I can just do this. Yeah, and now I can stick other things in there. I could stick even more recoil absorbers in there. But I don't have to. I could actually, fun fact, if you are, if you do end up with gaps in your APS, you can do something like this, because here's the thing, surge protectors can save your bacon, and if you are like me, and you like to stick your local weapon controllers on the turret itself, uh, EMP hitting even the very top of your turret uh, can ruin your day, because it can get all the way down here, take out the local weapon controller, and make you a very sad panda indeed. So, if you have random bits left in your uh, APS uh, Tetris, do not panic. You can always find something to fill it in with uh, if you so desire. And even extra armor. Like, there's nothing actually wrong with armoring your turret, uh, particularly if you offset it so the front has some extra armor. But enough about that, let's talk about the uh, orientation of these. So, this, if you want a turret that uses 8 meter long loaders, or uh, even among the taller ones, so 6 and 8 meter loaders are the ones which I consider to be kind of damn tall, because uh, 4 meter loaders are reasonably modest, actually. Like, you don't get super tall turrets with that. 6 meters, okay, this is now pushing it, and 8 meters is like, whoa. Wow, that, that's a giraffe loader if I've ever seen one. Long and skinny. So, yeah. I should probably read the notes for this. So, uh, yeah. So, this kind of 8 meter horizontal loader, pen depth railgun. Loaders are laid flat, with coolers and chargers filling in the gaps. And this is the best way to lob 8 meter shells while keeping the turret below 8 meters tall. And this is a railgun for style and volume efficiency points. Also, I'm not sure why I labeled this thing a pen depth, because it's uh, firing... Uh, railgun, no, not railgun shells, what the hell am I talking about? I mean, it's firing a hollow point. Railgun hollow point is no joke. So let's go find that shell. Where the hell did it go? Those shells are ridiculously fast, by the way, so I probably don't have any hope of catching it. So yeah, let's uh, talk about railguns for a brief moment. Uh, railgun... Uh, railguns aren't actually tremendously complicated to work into your Tetris already. There's just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, firstly, you need railgun chargers. Uh, railgun chargers are fairly easy because they connect to each other. So you'll see I've kind of got this overgrowth uh, set up right here, and the railgun chargers are just stacked uh, onto each other like that. So if you have a, a central um, a line of cooling vents or connectors or gauge increases, you can just branch them off that and that's not particularly difficult. I would recommend against, if possible, uh, doing what I've done here and sticking them at the top of the turret, because generally speaking, uh, if your turret is going to get damaged, it gets damaged from uh, the top down. So, railgun charges are very expensive, and you'll notice they are also flimsy. They only have 80 health, so... Uh, if possible, you want to do something like this. You want an undergrowth, and you want to stick them down there, because that they are quite literally the last thing you want to be blown up because the repair bill uh, if you're uh, whether you're in a tournament or whether you're playing the campaign it's a really prohibitive repair bill if you have to keep repairing these things so yeah that's the thing to keep in mind and the other thing to keep in mind is that you need um, railgun magnet attaching features which attach to either side of the APS firing piece and uh, Important thing to note, depending on what mantlet you're using, depends on how many of these things uh, you can use. So, uh, these things uh, determine how many lines of uh, barrel magnets you can use, and these things increase uh, the fraction of vehicle energy available to the railgun. So, you need a minimum amount of railgun magnets in order to get them uh, a certain amount of juice into the railgun, so to speak. 
And so if you don't want to extend these things like really way out along the barrel, uh, you might be tempted, and it's not actually that too bad an idea, to change which mantlet is being used. So uh, smaller mantlets allow you to connect uh, these, um, uh, these uh, magnet attaching fixtures on top uh, and the bottom as well as uh, on the sides. So keeping that in mind, uh, if I do this, and if I do this, so we're, we're going to go back to our 3 meter mantlet. I'm going to take that off. And uh, I can't actually connect uh, things through the mantlet. They have to... See? So, nope, they have to have a clear uh, line and uh, connect directly. Which is why um, the thing that uh, you cannot actually use rail guns in... Uh, is this mantlet right here. It's the 3x3 Omni mantlet. It, this is impossible to use uh, with railguns, and I say this because in videos past I have had craft use these, uh, usually front siders because that's where these things are at their most useful, and I've had people tell me you should make it a railgun. And I'm sorry to say, if you are needing to use this 3x3 Omni mantlet so it can aim um, kind of equally well in all directions, um, as it, well, you can see the azimuth range is now native 44 to 44, and elevation range is the same. Uh, you can't use railguns uh, with this. It is impossible. So, uh, the best you can manage is uh, using this 3x3, well, no, this 3 meter tall elevation mantlet, uh, which most of the time uh, does the job just fine. You can also use uh, the other ones like this, which is a reason why uh, these little mantlets are still somewhat useful, particularly if you are, if the setup you're using doesn't actually require the gun to aim like straight up or straight down. It's still quite handy dandy. And the last and probably most important thing to remember with railguns is that they do require battery energy and they require some way of you charging those batteries. In this particular case, I just have uh, injector engines uh, that have been rigged to 100% dedicate their power to charging batteries. Uh, but there's arguably more efficient ways to do that. You could have more efficient engines, you could have steam engines, steam turbines, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, I do not recommend using RTGs to power a railgun, because these things can get very, very thirsty. So you'll notice this thing is using uh, 27,000 rail energy per shot, so... Uh, and it fires... Uh, it fires 7 rounds per minute, which is reasonable for such massive shells. So now I've banged on about the railgun, let's talk about this and why I actually like it a bit more. I have a habit of not using railguns that much simply because it's an extra layer of complexity and they require a backline that looks something like this. Um, this, however, is a note as to why it's quite handy to have both uh, uh, undergrowth and overgrowth uh, for shells that have a lot of gunpowder. Because uh, I remind you, this thing is mostly gunpowder, so... Uh, it's going to make the barrel hot, 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 and means it needs a lot of cooling. So, in this particular case, you can see how much cooling it is because there's this large base that's almost 100% coolers apart from the bits which aren't. This long line of coolers, and then even more coolers up here. So, you can see the cooling limit is 34.7, actually slightly more than we need. And, uh, yeah, so this thing has a pretty decent rate of fire. And you'll notice uh, the setup right here. So once again, we've got the unfortunate symbolism, uh, recoil rings uh, just being like here. And of course, that's not quite enough. So we have extended uh, this thing out a little bit uh, with connectors because we don't actually need any more coolers. And we have stuck uh, eight meter long recoil absorbers on them. So yeah, and there is a little bit of extra space left in here, but like I said, if you're really paranoid, uh, you can do stuff like this. Make absolutely sure that you don't get fried by EMP. That might be a bit of overkill, but yeah, that is handy. You'll also notice I've stuck stuff placing forward. So, uh, recoil absorbers are... I do have the habit of sticking them up in the turret cap. That is probably not the best idea, and I don't recommend doing it because, well, these are actually kind of expensive. So you'll see uh, gauge increases, they're about 20... Uh, materials, health of 150, armor 5. Uh, these things have a fair amount more armor, but um, yeah, they're pricey, so you don't actually want to stick them where they can get shot at, because like I said before, repair bill is expensive. So 
Yeah, I'm just gonna disintegrate something beautiful uh, with this. Where is my friend the Tarpon? Uh, there we go. So yeah, the large kinetic APS uh, guns like this are... Excuse you, Tarpon. They're real endgame weapons because there's no hard counter to them. Uh, they're hard to dodge. And um, they do a hell of a lot of damage, so... To give you an idea of how much damage, um, well, you've already seen, this does about 17,000, uh, wait, no, it was, a, how much was it? I forget, it's like 13,000, uh, uh, thump damage. This thing has 27,000 rail use, so if I go here, and go 27,000, uh, suddenly that's about 18,000, but much higher armor piercing, which means... Uh, this thing melts heavy armor like there's uh, no tomorrow. You see the tarpon is uh, having a really bad day, partially because it's mostly made of wood, but also because uh, strong gun is strong, strong gun is deacon's hell. So yeah, big, big rail guns, uh, whether they be uh, penetration depth shells or just straight up uh, hollow point sabo, uh, they're no joke. Really no joke, let's see. I tend to think of them as like magic tricks, it's just they make things fall off. Um, yeah, they do that. Uh, yep, we just uh, we just disabled the main gun on the tarpon. Uh, no biggie. No biggie whatsoever. So, if nothing else, that's the thing to take away from it, is that rail guns are reasonably easy to squirrel into either the overgrowth or the undergrowth. And... Um, yeah, just, uh, you gotta lay your, uh, long loaders flat if you want to keep your head down. So, that's basically it for how to arrange your long loaders, uh, big circles. I did actually do a tutorial on how to make, uh, circular shapes, uh, some time ago. Uh, go check out that if you want to see how to make a nice circular, uh, turret well. But what I usually do is, like, I err on the side of making a diamond, which isn't space efficient, but it pretty much always works. So yeah, we're gonna move right along. What else can we talk about? We can talk about ejectors. And this is one of the things where uh, Borderwise kicks himself because ejectors are perhaps one of the best things ever added to the game and it took me a really long time to understand why. So let's talk about the shell. This is a really volatile shell, or at least it would be, except we're using ejectors and we're using frag it. So, um, to give you an idea of uh, what happens uh, to... Well, one of the main weaknesses of APS, and this is a very deliberate weakness, is that they are volatile. If you've got a shell with a lot of gunpowder or a lot of uh, any kind of chemical warhead in it, uh, when the autoloader is destroyed with shells in it, it goes kablooey and it usually takes the whole turret with it. And um, so, yeah, that's where ammo ejectors and emergency diffusers come in. And I used to avoid making these because I thought it would make the Tetris really difficult. As it turns out, that is not true. It is fairly straightforward to make a Tetris that incorporates these because these things are only two meters long. And uh, they can be added in reasonably easily. They're also really cheap, so there's not a lot of reason not to use them. But first off, let us show you, I will show you what happens if you delete uh, uh, one of these things and, you know, what happens if they uh, firstly turn off god mode and, well, jeez, uh, I wonder what will happen. So it goes kablooey. You'll notice that the rest of the turret did not explode and that's because of two things. Firstly, the ejectors. Uh, incidentally, let's go here. Uh, incidentally, uh, if you eject shells uh, without this component right here, the emergency ejection defuse, uh, they've still got to go somewhere, so it is just really uh, easier and safer, literally, uh, just to, if whenever you use ejectors, use this emergency ejection defuse, because it basically makes the shells vanish. So, uh, keeping in mind that that exploded when I did this before, look what happens. Absolutely nothing, and it also works uh, if a clip gets destroyed as well. Rambot, I love what you're doing, but you don't need to do that, baby. You don't need so I can destroy a clip. Nothing, 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 nothing. And so, basically, what is the what this has turned into is I've uh, 
with the combination of a, uh, emergency defuse and ejectors, this APS turret is now every bit as uh, resilient as a cram turret, which is one less reason to use cram cannons and yet another reason to use APS because they're better uh, practically in every single way. So yeah, that is super handy and let's talk about the Tetris a little bit more, how you work these things uh, into your Tetris. So, uh, you'll notice here that um, once again, I believe I mentioned this before, rotational symmetry is your best friend when it comes to APS. Uh, so what we've got here, we've got a kind of cross of loaders coming off here and then you add clips uh, in a circular fashion. So you're kind of circling around here. I actually usually turn mirror mode off when I do that. And you get all the ejectors pointing and rotating the same way. So they rotate around here. And they're still rotating and still rotating in that unfortunate symbolism thing that I seem to have a habit of doing. Maybe I need to see a therapist. And, since we've got a lovely layer of undergrowth in here, at just every gap, I just stick uh, a recoil absorber because you, you know, might as well, and we need recoil absorption anyway. And then as we go up here, uh, you'll notice how the uh, Tetris works. Uh, I have managed to avoid uh, the sticky question of the corners uh, by just going off there and connecting the loaders to each other. So it is entirely possible to make very good uh, advanced cannons and the loaders are basically just connected to one point and they just branch off each other like this. Admittedly, you can't get the ultra maximum uh, two clips per loader, but it doesn't actually matter uh, that much because they're all loaded and they're all connected and it's all fan dabby dozy. Let's shoot something. Let's shoot. Um, what can we shoot? Let's shoot. And let's shoot. Let's shoot the Kraken. The Kraken's fun to shoot at. So yeah, this is a 500mm gun, by the way, and um, I'm just going to casually turn off God Mode, and you can see for yourself that uh, this thing has taken, like, multiple, pr well, multiple high-powered explosive shells to the face, and it's not disintegrating immediately. In fact, the fortress full of ammunition disintegrated before the turret did. So yeah, super ha wow, now it's being juggled. So yeah, you still need to protect and armor your turrets because uh, it's a bit of a problem if you don't do that. So yeah, and last but not least, let's talk about multiple piece. Um, oh darn it, I spawned the thing too high. I spawned it too high. Too high. And now I sit on this fortress that was just exploding because I'm conscious of safety. So, this is where things get a little bit hairy, so... Like I said before, you are usually better off having one really big, super optimized APS system rather than a bunch of smaller ones all squeezed into the same turret. Uh, but there are reasons uh, to have multi-piece turrets, and the main reason that I think about is that it makes it a lot easier to lob a bunch of different kinds of shell all at the same time. So here are the shells. You'll notice that I'm always introducing the shells first, and that is because when designing an advanced cannon, it is usually smarter, I say usually, it's not always, uh, to design the shell first and then build a gun for that shell rather than the other way around. Because otherwise you do what I end up doing, just endlessly testing a gun trying to find the perfect shell for it, and it's just a lot easier to design the shell first and think, hmm, okay, I can picture what this needs. So here we have our shells, and this one is called Becky, and she is a puree she... Uh, shell. Uh, this one is called uh, Stacy, and she's a pure frag shell. Uh, this one is Helena, and she's pure EMP. And this one is Jackie, and she's pure flak for no other reason than that's cool. And I've already forgotten all the names I gave these shells, so I'm not sure why I went with this bit. But in any case, uh, all these chemical warheads have their advantages and their drawbacks, and if you want to be cute and want to be sure that uh, you get the benefits of uh, all of them without uh, too much of the drawbacks, you lob uh, multiple, uh, well basically you lob them all at the same time. And this is where multi-cannon turrets come in super handy. So you'll notice right here we've got our friend uh, right here, which is a double turret, 500 millimeters, 4 meter uh, long shells times 2, 
And, as I was saying before, good for easy lobbing of more than one shell from one turret. Rotational symmetry is very handy here. So I've made notes of the total turret cost and the total RPM, basically counting both guns. Um, uh, this costs about uh, just shy of 27,000 materials. Total RPM is 11.8 uh, per gun times 2, 23.6. And so, the reason why that's important is because there's diminishing returns later um, if you stick too many firing pieces on the same turret. So, let's talk about Tetris. So, immediately, the highlighted building thingy is super handy because you can see which uh, half belongs to which gun and which doesn't. I have also painted the input so it's clear to see what belongs to what. So, important thing here is that none of uh, the loaders touch and uh, none of the connectors should uh, touch like this. This is a no-no uh, because that confuses the hell uh, out of everybody. Uh, so you might not want to do that. So it's rotational symmetry again. You'll notice that uh, what usually uh, how I do this is that I start uh, from the front and then I have kind of all the clips roughly pointed the same way and we rotate around there, and that means this gap in the middle, uh, in between these two guns, which otherwise would have to be left uh, empty if you wanted to be perfectly symmetrical between them, is filled with clips, and right in the middle it is filled with uh, recoil absorbers, because you're going to need those anyway. Recoil absorbers are the things that I always kind of stick in last, um, simply because once all the shells are loaded, that's when you look at the firing piece and go, hmm, how much recoil does this need? So yeah, so rotational symmetry, it's got undergrowth here because that makes uh, the Tetris uh, and just placing the autoloaders a lot easier. Strictly speaking, didn't really need them, uh, need it that badly for this because all the autoloaders are connected to each other anyway. Uh, but it's still handy to have it there because it gets uh, enough cooling. In fact, this thing arguably needs even more cooling because that's the problem um, with having multiple firing pieces. Uh, in a single turret system is that you need enough coolers and recoil absorption or railgun draw and uh, charges and stuff like that for both of them. So you're already doubling uh, the amount of guns that you need to optimize, which can be a slight pain in the tush. But this is a decent setup because this thing is lobbing uh, HE shells and frag shells at the same time. So I'm just going to go uh, demonstrate that. So generally speaking, it's... Um this, let's go here and turn that off. There's no particular reason to do this, but I feel like it. So we got our friend right here. Bang! Let's go there. And there's advantage, like I said, there's advantages to different shell types. A uh, frag tends to make real mincemeat of um, uh, things that get in its way, but it's not as. Uh, it doesn't damage blocks as evenly as HE does, amongst other things. So. If we go there, also that just landed uh, straight on the shields, and I hate that, so I'm going to keep firing for a little bit. So there the HE shell does something. There the frag shell does something. The frag shells are great at taking out blocks with slightly more health, and then you get magic stuff like that. Okay, you go away for a second because you're noisy and I don't like you. But what about uh, triple-barreled guns? How do you deal with that? So that's uh, this is where things get a little bit funky, and triple-barreled guns are actually probably the least advisable uh, number to go for, even though it is super cool because it evokes things like, you know, the Iowa-class battleship and stuff like that, and all the World War II nerds love these, and it's understandable why. It is a real pain in the tush uh, to get these all firing the same way, and that's because this is a cube-based game, and you're trying to work with the number three. So, we've got this triple turret, and you can have regular symmetry, so rotational symmetry isn't really helpful here. It is usually a pain in the butt to get all three guns firing at exactly the same rate. It's not impossible, it's just really fiddly. And um, me and my cute emoji right there is probably doing this in a cube-based game. So, total turret cost, you'll notice, is a little bit more than our double-barreled friend over here is 28 is uh, just shy of 29,000 materials in total RPM is 7.3 times 2 
uh, plus 12.6, so the guns on the side here unfortunately don't fire very fast, 7.3, 7.3, 12.6, means you get 27.2, which is slightly more shells per minute uh, than our friend over here. Uh, but for, oh dear, like 2,000 more materials, which isn't actually that bad now, I'll say that loud. So, yeah, that's handy dandy, and, um, this one is actually slightly easier. So, here's the thing, triple turrets, uh, less optimized because they're not all firing at the same time, and, yeah, like, you'll notice they're also spaced slightly differently, which isn't a game changer because, uh, you can always get the corners in to just kink in the neck and go up a little bit. But that means you need to do something with this uh, top layer right here. And it's all a giant kind of pain in the tush. So, yeah. So, uh, this guy in the middle is the HE turret. And it's just pretty straightforward. And uh, just got this line of um, loaders down here. And very important thing here. You'll notice that the loaders are offset here. They're not touching. So, whenever you build multi-barrel turrets like this. You've got to make sure the autoloaders are the number one culprit. Uh, for uh, one gun accidentally taking all the loaders and just making a mess of things, so they're just offset. And this is one of the reasons why, in this case, uh, undergrowth is actually very helpful, because it means that you can just uh, offset them no problem, and you don't need to get a massive headache figuring out exactly how to do that. Uh, but yeah, these it is unfortunately the case that in this setup, because I didn't spend a huge amount of time on this, that the guns on the side uh, don't have as many loaders, for one thing, and uh, they don't have as much coolers or anything like that, so they don't fire as quickly, and that is very sad for So we've got a fry gun over here, and I believe, yep, this is an EMP shell over here. Uh, let's shoot at the, uh, let's shoot at the Kraken again, simply because that was so hilarious the first time. Let's go over here. So EMP shells are not handy on their own, but uh, if you want to be cute, um... Uh, you can do stuff like this. And I'll immediately show you that uh, you'll notice that the HE shells tend to come in a lot faster. So there goes uh, the frag shell again. Just gonna do that. Bang, 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 bang. Yep, and there's the EMP shell. EMP, very handy for uh, turning off uh, things like uh, local weapon controllers, munition warners, uh, laser warners and stuff like that, super handy. And it's just, if nothing else, I kind of like uh, the staggered fire uh, feeling that you get, well, see right there, we just turned that off that Seawiz turret. And it also vaporizes shields, which is super nice. Bang, bang, bang. I was holding the wrong turret. Shoot! And shoot once more. Blow something up, please. Why are we aiming for something very stupid? We're aiming for something very stupid. How about now? Okay, so there's our triple barrel friend, and now quad guns. And this is where I'm going to stop because anything beyond this starts to get a teeny weeny bit silly. And I say that, whereas uh, just uh, the other day I made an eight barrel turret uh, in a Let's Build video. And I recommend you go watch that because it is, well, I'm not going to say easy, it's just time consuming. So. Uh, quad turret. So this is like the times two turret, but uh, it's got twice as much gun, and each, so each gun has roughly a quarter of the turret space uh, instead of half of it. And you can share space uh, evenly apart from the central pillar, so fairly straightforward to get equalized fire rate for all the pieces. Incidentally, cram cannons are like this as well. Uh, if you use the right kind of Tetris, uh, a quad turret is fairly straightforward uh, to get identical fire rates uh, for all guns involved. Uh, you get major diminishing returns if you stick more firing pieces than this, so you really do it for only maximum mandatory fun. So the total turret cost is actually a little bit cheaper than our friend over here, for some reason. Uh, 25,695 as opposed to almost 29,000 over here. Uh, the total RPM is 5.9 times 4, so the, our rate of fire has actually gone down slightly. So this is where I'm saying, uh, pointing out that diminishing returns does come into play. Uh, the main reason we're probably getting uh, cheaper costs is because we have less coolers, because we need less coolers, because we've got less uh, loaders in the first place. So yeah, the total RPM is uh, back down to uh, 23.6, which is 5.9 times 4 as opposed to 27.2, and as opposed to 23.6, so 
it's actually identical uh, rate of fire to this because surprise surprise same volume uh, cost wise 26 uh, 715 uh, 25 695 so this is actually cheaper funnily enough which i guess is the uh, handy way of taking advantage of the inherent uh, cooling properties of just bay ps barrel existing it comes with it basically is spawns in uh, with some extra cooling so there's an advantage i guess um especially for big things like uh if you're gonna have multiple turrets they tend to be the big guns simply because they need a lot of cooling and I think I have not done the math, so don't quote me on this, but uh, beyond a certain size of gun and shell, you are slightly better off uh, just sticking another gun in the setup rather than trying to max it out with coolers, because I think coolers have diminishing returns as well. So yeah, this fella is, um, like I said, it's similar to uh, the 2x2 two two over there, except that each uh, half is split into two, so it's just quarters. And if I shrink all the blocks, you'll see that uh, the gaps in between them is taken up by recoil absorbers. And there's just a little bit of uh, undergrowth that's actually mostly taken up by, by gauge increases rather than anything else. In fact, all of it is. Because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Which is the number you get to a 500mm gun. And then it's all coolers up here. And the Tetris up here is getting a little funky because... Um, Unlike our friend over here, in which these, um, I have done a kind of haphazard job of uh, spacing them, they've got a two meter gap in between them, uh, these guys don't have that, they're all one gap away from each other, and uh, so you can kind of have the firing pieces all nice and snug uh, next to each other like this, because you can just uh, do uh, sharp corners around here and go, incidentally, this thing is still not connected, so there's a cooler right here, uh, this thing has its uh, blunt bit, I'm just going to call it that, pointing at the connecty bit over here so it's not connected and that's all fine uh, the problem with uh, doing this is that you've got to find out what on earth you're supposed to do with this middle bit in here so what I sometimes do uh, in my infinite wisdom is just the other day uh, I stuck a surge protectors in these three corners here I'm just gonna demonstrate right that here here and here uh, which isn't the best idea because you just lose uh, some uh, recoil absorption here But then you can stick the local weapon controller right down uh, the middle of this and If you in case you are worried about the rest of the space uh, here is a handy block uh, You can stick these connection blocks in here and then you can have a solid core of surge protectors or other blocks uh, which you feel uh, will be super helpful down the core of there. So that's the main uh, use I found uh, for this kind of central column of otherwise wasted space. And quad guns are super cool otherwise. So uh, let us celebrate just by um, uh, blowing up uh, the Kraken again. So we're gonna go here, Kraken, open fire with the guns. So notice that middle gun over on the on the triple turret actually has the best rate of fire out of all of these. I love Flacky Swords and the Great. So basically, yeah, that is the... I guess... I have no idea whether this counts as basics because beyond a certain point, uh, basics and from the depths actually gets kind of complicated. So call that a uh, miniature tour miniature tour this video is almost an hour long a tour of the APS techniques which I find help me a lot in my Tetris and they're reasonably straightforward and simple and they make things which go bang in a satisfactory way so on that note uh, I hope you learned something and if you didn't learn something I hope you enjoyed me shooting at the Kraken so thank you all so much for watching please like comment subscribe if you want to see more videos like this support me on patreon or YouTube membership if you like. It really helps. And there's fun perks in it for you. Thank you to all my current supporters. And I will see you next time in From the Depths. Farewell. Wave goodbye, turrets.